Chaim's up, I guess, and will tell us about randomized preconditioning. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for inviting me and the organizers for organizing this. So I'm going to talk about uh, solving canonical correlation analysis. I'll explain what that is. But in general, the technique I'm going to present is relevant in general when you have quadratic equality concern, but to keep things concrete, we'll mainly discuss uh, CCA. And we want to use randomized preconditioning. So I will start with some background and motivation for what what we are going to do, and then go into the details. So there's basically two approaches to leverage randomization when you're talking about numerical linear algebra. There is the original technique of sketch and solve, the one that came in the, in the first paper by uh, Michael Mon and Petros Dineas, where this, the idea is to, you have a problem, and this is only in kind of rough, uh, rough lines, it's not the, you know, the variance of this technique, but in general, you have an input, you sketch the input, you use that to form a smaller problem, you solve the problem exactly, and then you, have a, you use that solution to form a solution to the original problem and try to reason about how good that solution is. Another technique, which appears less in the literature, is the idea of sketch to precondition. You, take this, you sketch the input, like in the sketch and solve, but now you don't solve a new problem, but you go back to the original problem and somehow use the sketch to accelerate the solution of the original problem, mainly as a preconditioner in some iterative method. Let's look at an example, a very simple example, overdetermined least squares. The sketch and solve approach will start with, you have an input A and an input B. You will sketch them, you'll multiply them by a random sketching matrix S. The sketching matrix can be a sampling matrix, it can be a fast randomizer demand matrix, there's more than one ways to do this sketch, but you do it both on A and on B, and that gives you a new, a new problem that you just solve. You can solve it either using QR or SVD, you pick your favorite method, and it gives you a Y, that Y is the same size as the X, so it's a valid candidate solution for the original problem, so you return that solution. And you can reason how good that is if you select the sketching matrix correctly and you have enough rows in that matrix, you can reason about this solution. We're not going to go to details on this analysis. The statue, uh, the precondition approach works slightly different. You still sketch the, the A matrix to form B, but you don't sketch the, the right hand side, you don't sketch B, the, the vector B. But now you want to use B to, to accelerate the solution of the original problem. The way to do that there's more than one way to do it, but one way to do it is to now form a QR factorization of B. It gives you an orthogonal basis, which you, don't, you discard, and an upper triangular matrix R, which you now use as a preconditioner in an iterative method. Specifically here I wrote using the LSQR, but you can use other iterative method. But the idea is that you solve this original problem AX minus B using an iterative method and use the R as a preconditioner. The R was built using the sketch. So each approach has its advantages. Uh, for the sketch and solve, I mean, uh, this is a kind of the features, and there's an advantage and disadvantages. So the sketch and solve approach, if you do, if you use the, the sketching correctly and you design your algorithm in a, in a good way, then you'll get high success rate, but the dependency on the, on the accuracy, which again, depends on how the specific problem you want to, to use, but in general, if you want epsilon accuracy, whatever it means for that specific problem, your dependence is polynomial, but you're not going to do no, uh, not going to do iteration, so that gives you a chance of doing something like streaming or anything that passes only one time or a few times over the date. So the advantage is that because there's no iteration and you're, and you're basically just going over the data, sketching the data and, and working on it, it's very fast. And the running time is deterministic. But since you have polynomial dependence on the accuracy, you only get crude, uh, good accuracy, crude accuracy. And it's a Monte Carlo algorithm. You get a solution, you don't really know if it's a good solution. You hope it, you have an high probability it is a good solution, but you don't know it is a good solution. Um, generally, in, in data science application, this crude approximation is fine, and this, this is good, and that's why we are, you know, there's a workshop on, on randomized numerical linear algebra. For the sketch and, and to pre approach, you, you also have high success rate, 
But now the success rate is usually <coughs> not on the, on the quality of the solution, but rather on the running time. You know you're solving the problem to a good accuracy, but you only, you, you only reason about its running time. And you have an exponential accuracy dependence like log one over epsilon. So you're going to get, you, can, you are able to get very accurate solutions if you need them. But you're going to do iterations. So the advantage is that you can get very high accuracy, and when you are successful, you have a good solution. But it's generally slower than the sketch and solve approach. I mean, at least uh, if, you're, if you're willing to go with crude accuracy. If you want high accuracy, the sketch and solve approach will not work. And you have to do iterations, so you have a problem with streaming. So which approach is better? Really, it, it depends on what you want and how accurate you want the solution and how much we are willing to pay. Can you make multiple passes of the data? I'm not going to go into, into which one is better. My point is that each one of them can be useful and we want basically both. But if you look at the literature, there's a lot of method on the sketch and solve. I have a list here of, certain, of problems that people have suggested over the years, a sketch and solve approach to, to approximate them. And it's not an exhaustive list. But if you look at the stage to precondition, there's some work on that. But it's mainly of uh, regression algorithms, like linear regression solving linear equations or ordinary rigid regression, uh, vines like that. You can kernelize it. That's been recently suggested. There's, of course, all the work on Laplacian solvers. That's for square matrices. There's even some work on, on hierarchical structure where they use randomization. And even linear system with tensor stru product structure, but still, it's mainly solving linear equations. And this is essentially an exhaustive list. Not most of the methods that are on this side don't have a sketch to precondition approach. <coughs> and the question that kind of motivated my work here is can randomized precondition be used beyond regression? Not just for solving regression problem, but solving problems that are, don't have this regression structure that, get, that gets you an iterative method, an iterative uh, linear solver or a, a, and lets you precondition it. <laughs> so this is this, the executive summary of what I'm going to present and I'll go into the details. I'm going to discuss a randomized precondition approach for canonical correlation analysis. Uh, like I said in the first slide, uh, it, it can be applied more generally to when you have problem with quadratic equality constraints. The basic idea is to use some technique called Riemannian optimization. Uh, canonical correlation analysis is basically a, a problem on, which has constraints that are on a manifold, so when you want to solve it, you need to use, you can do it multiple ways. One way to do it is to use Riemannian optimization, and on top of that, we add sketching to get our technique. And the key observation that we use to do that is that, like I said, CCA is an optimization on, on manifold constraint. I'm going to explain what CCA is in the next slide. When you do Riemannian optimization, you need to set a manifold and impose a metric on that manifold. And the way you select the metric matters to the convergence of the algorithm. You want to use a specific metric, but using it is expensive, like, like, we, like in the case of solving an equation. So you can use sketching to approximate the metric you want to use and then get uh, fast convergence, but without paying the price of, of using the expensive metric. That's the executive summary. Let's go into the details. So unless you're, not everybody's familiar with CCA, so in one slide I'm going to summarize what this technique is. So it's a, it's a linear algebra problem, but as a statistical motivation, you basically have observa you have two random variables, and you want to, f to find how you can rotate them so that they will be ma the correlation will be maximized. So you, one way to do that, one way the, how CCA does that is that you take you have you put your data in two data matrices x and y. Most of them have n observation. The x has d sub x uh, features and y are d sub y features, and you select some regularization parameter which can be zero. <coughs> and then basically you want to find the vectors that will be linear combination of the features so that be between the two random variables, the, the correlation will be maximized. So the correlation is just the dot product of the transformed data. So you transform y by multiplying by v, transform x by multiplying by u, and now you want the correlation to be maximized. So I'm going to only discuss 
finding the top correlation, there's ways to generalize the problem of CCA to having more low, more correlations, but we are going to focus on finding the, the largest correlation. But of course, just maximizing this, uh, can, you can drive that to infinity, so you need to impose some constraint. And the constraint is that, that that are imposed is, are, are the following, that basically you, are, you, you have to be on, uh, on the sphere induced by the x transpose x. And you, you put that, uh, you impose this on the u's, and, and a corresponding uh, constraint on the, on the v's. And in, in a regularization setting, you regularize these ground matrices. And if lambda is equal to zero, that's what you call in the linear algebra um, uh, literature, principal angles and vectors between subspaces. And if lambda is bigger than zero, it's just a regularized version of that. So this is the CCA problem. Any questions about that before I go on? Yeah. So uh, you could have a constraint of u being a unit vector. So no, no, yeah, you know. so it's x u that's the unit vector and y v that those are the unit vectors. Yeah. So the angle is between the spaces of x and y. Yes, because you, you want something that's spanned in the end. You want something in the span of x and something in the span of y. So how do you solve CCA? Well, there is a direct method, the Bjork and Golub algorithm. It's fairly simple. You start by building a Q, uh, build orthogonalizing x and y. You do a QR factorization. You get an orthogonal basis QX, an orthogonal uh, basis QY. You, 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 the, the R's are not that important. You need both the X and both the Q's and the R's. To, uh, then you basically take these two matrices, multiply them, and do an SVD. And from that SVD, you can find the U and the V that you are looking for. Again, I'm not going to do details why this algorithm works. This is a direct method that solves this problem. And the cost is n d squared, basically. So you need to, you have, you have both features in x and y, so it's n d x squared plus n d y squared, but in general it's n d squared, which is pretty good. But again, we want to, to reduce this dependence. <coughs> There's also a sketch and solve approach. Um, uh, it appeared in a paper uh, by myself and Christos Busidis, Ivan Toledo, and Anastasia Zusias in 2014. The idea is, again, it's a very simple sketch and solve approach. You start with your x and y, you sketch them using a sketch matrix. It can be any, it can be sampling, it can be ra fast randomized and amount. You just need uh, to have a subspace embedding on the x and y. That's what you need. And then, once you reduce the problem size, you use the, the direct method, the Bjorg and Golub algorithm, to find a, an approximate solution. And that gives you an improved dependence on n if you select the sketching matrix correctly. But again, you have the epsilon to the power minus 2 dependence and on the accuracy parameter. And here, the accuracy parameter is how well you approximate the, the, the correlation. So we want. We want a basically a, a, a precondition approach to this problem. We, we already have a sketch and solve, but can we precondition it? So for that, you need an iterative method. So there are actually an iterative method suggested by Golomb in 95. It's basically an alternating least square approach, a very natural approach, <coughs> where at each point, you, you have bo you are, you're keeping the iterates both a u and a v, and you iterate. You want, at one point, you fix the v, and you, and you improve the u so that the correlation will be maximized, and then you and and then you fix the u and you max and you optimize you fix the the v and you optimize the fix the u and you optimize the v. So basically, the way you write it is that you now if, if, when you want the next u, you fix the current v, and then you try to to find the u that will get you as close <coughs> as possible to y times the current v with the regularization, that has actually as a closed form uh, solution that involves these gram matrices. So you have these gram matrices, and you, want, you write this like this, but then the solution is essentially this. But this moves you outside your consent, so you need to, uh, to enforce the consent by projecting back to the constraint set. And now you do the same when u is fixed and, and you optimize the v. So 
there is this algorithm, actually in the original paper, I don't think they had any result, but on any result on the convergence rate. But uh, recently in 2016, so, uh, there was a, an analysis that showed that this has exponential convergence. The, the condition number that determines how fast it converges depends on the, on the gap, on the gap between the largest canonical correlation and the next largest canonical correlation. I didn't really define what is the second largest, but there is a definition of the second largest. And, and of course, you have dependence on the gap. This is a, because canonical correlation is essentially an eigen, a generalized eigenvalue problem, you expect to see this dependence on the eigengap. So, OK. So there's this result. Seems, you know, L, that we are, we are happy about an iterative result. It has exponential convergence. Uh, what's the problem? The problem is that how do we solve this problem? So we, can have, we have this explicit solution. We can use that. But if we look at the solution, it involves the inverse of this gram matrix. So of course, you're not going to form the inverse. You're going to do a Cholesky factorization of this positive definite matrix. But even to do this Cholesky factorization, factorization you need to form the sigma xx matrix. Now, if you form the sigma xx matrix, that's an nd squared operation. So what did you gain? You have a direct method that do a, does a QR factorization of the x and a QR factorization of y. That already does nd squared. But now we are going to, at the first step, do an nd squared operation. So obviously, you're not going to save, by, save anything by using an iterative method. Wait, how, isn't this just a rate regression? Yeah, so another approach is to view this as regression and try to solve this approximately. That's true. Um, Can you do like precondition returns from like we did? Yeah, so, so, so these guys, okay, so these, these guys, what they did, they actually try, they, they, tr they solve this regression using fast uh, coordinate descent, but then they have the dependence on the condition number of x. And why? They don't precondition, but I was asking. They don't, okay. No, so one thing you can try to do is try to use kind of a, a, a region regression solver on this x. Yeah, but dependence on the condition number regardless, but the sensitivity of these squares problems. No, yeah, you have that if you're not preconditioned this, but you can try to precondition yeah. this. You can solve, the, in every iteration, you're going to solve two region regression so, problems. The, the application of the preconditioner, the conditioning of that is again dependent on the conditioning of x. You don't get away from it in the end. No, you do get away from it. You do get away because you, 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 form, a, you, you form a sketch of x and you, and you so can do it. The application of the sketch also has a conditioner number. I don't think that's the point because you're going to do iterations to find a solution. I just think I, 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 that will work. I just think I'm going to present a, a way so that will work better. So yeah, you can do that. But uh, I think what will happen is that you'll have to solve, you'll, solve, you'll spend too much iteration in this inner iteration. We want to avoid this inner iteration. We don't want to have an outer iteration like this and an inter iteration that are like this. We want one, one, one method. OK, so that's repeating what I said earlier. So that the setup time is nd squared, but then every iteration, once we finish the setup, every iteration takes nd. It's just one pass of the matrix. And the number of iterations is as exponential dependence. So, so in, in one aspect, we are very happy. We have a very good iteration complexity, and the iteration cost is, is fine. But our best our problem is with the setup time. It's too large. It's as expensive as a direct method. OK, but the key observation that, that I'm going to use is actually that this algorithm, while it's, it's written as a not in least square, it's actually a Riemannian gradient descent algorithm, Riemannian algorithm, gradient descent. So again, I need to give you some back on what I mean by that. So this is a one slide uh, background on, on, on something that cannot be described in one slide or in one talk, uh, but I needed to give some back on. So basically, in Riemannian optimization, Riemannian optimization we want to solve problems of the following form. We want to minimize some function subject to a constraint that, the that, the, that our vector belongs to some smooth manifold. So here, graphically, trying to illustrate the algorithm, this is the manifold over here. It locally looks like Euclidean, but it's not Euclidean. So we want to do iterates. So we, want, uh, so we have to stay on the manifold at all time. So there's various ways to do that. You can generalize most optimization method from, from the Euclidean setting to the Riemannian setting. One of the simplest is uh, gradient descent. So what do you do in gradient descent in the Euclidean setting? You take your point, you find the gradient, you progress along the gradient. You, do, you, you add 
you take the, the negative of the Guardian, multiply it by step size, and add it. You cannot really do that in the remanent case because the gradient now is, is some vector in the tangent space, which is a linear space. So if at your current iterate, there is a tangent space at that point. Inside that tangent space, every, every, every vector is tangent to the manifold. It's a way to, it's a direction on the manifold that is locally. But if you, want, if you take the vector and just add it up, that's going to get you outside the manifold. So what you do to get back to the manifold is some operation that's called a retraction that gets you back to the manifold. One way to do this is actually to go, move along the geodesic in the direction of, of the vector, but that's an expensive operation, so there are, there's, there's a, a, a construct called the retraction which locally approximates the geodesic and lets you move around the, along the, uh, to have steps in the direction of the gradient. So now, but also the gradient, what is the gradient? Now we, we are, the gradient is, is no longer what's clear what, what, what that means. It's, it's, uh, now we only have tangent vector, uh, vectors in the tangent space. So there is the Riemannian gradient, uh, which is denoted here by grad, and it really <coughs> depends on the manifold, but what's crucial, it doesn't only depend on the manifold, but it also depends on how you measure the, uh, um, dot products in this tangent space on the Riemannian matrix. So the manifold, there's a smooth manifold, which is your constraint, you impose on that a Riemannian matrix that turns it into a Riemannian manifold that gives you the notion of a gradient because the notion of a gradient is a, is, is a, is a, is a tangent method that makes you the most progress toward minimizing, maximizing or minimizing function. So you take this Riemannian gradient, you multiply it by a step size, but now to do the step, you no longer just add, you do this operation of retraction. Now, it's, what's important in this slide is that this Riemannian gradient, the direction you want to progress, it really depends on the matrix choice. You can, you can choose the matrix multiple ways, and each one will define a different gradient. And, uh, and if, you, if you choose this correctly, your, your method will converge faster, basically. So you can, so you can write alternate in least squares Riemannian steepest descent. The function is just the optimization function we wrote earlier. If you look at the constraints, there is basically a manifold domain. It's basically the product manifold of two generalized Stifel manifolds. The, the projection operation that we took, we took a step and we projected back to the constraint, that's exactly one of the retraction that is used on that manifold, one of the most popular retraction. And, and, the, and the steps that we are taking, this is the formulas for the step. This is, this is the, this is a, if you select the, the step size correctly, then putting this formula gives you back the, the ALS. They are exactly the, the, the Riemannian gradient that corresponds to this matrix, this matrix, this Riemannian matrix that involved the sigma x-axis and the sigma y-y's. So this is an old uh, Riemannian steeper descent. And what's important here is that we selected this matrix. This gave you the gradient and this gave you as the algorithm. This on one side gave us the good iteration complexity, made the method uh, converge fast. But on the other hand, because we, we have the sigma xx and sigma yy's here in the metric, then the inverses pop up in the, in the Riemannian gradient, and that's what causes the, the high cost for every step. So this is a common metric. Usually when you, people are doing optimization on general stifle manifolds, they are going to use this metric. I mean, usually they use only one manifold. You have a product of each manifold, but this is the Riemannian ma metric on the first, on this manifold. This is a, the, the natural Riemannian metric on this manifold. This is the natural Riemannian metric on this manifold. And ad adding them is the, nat is the most natural thing to do. And that gives, this gives a good convergence bound, but, it's, but, it, but it causes the expensive setup. up. So what can we do? We can just try to replace these metrics, uh, sigma xx and sigma yy, with some approximations that are cheaper to solve. So basically now instead of sigma xx and sigma yy, we use mxx, mmyy. Those are any matrices that we form. We are going to use sketching matrix to form them. And then you need to update your Riemannian gradient. You get this uh, a bit annoying formula, but that's the formula you get. But what's important about it it doesn't involve any inverses with sigma x6. It does involve a product with sigma x6, but that's fine. You multiply by x and you multiply by x transform. That's an ND operation, but it only involves inverses 
of the MXX, but the MXX is something that you want to solve cheap, you're going to form cheaply. And then you just use, instead of, we are not going to restrict ourselves to gradient descent, you can use line search or you can use Riemannian CG. Why restrict ourselves to a fixed step size, which is not, not, um, not necessarily the best. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to go over these two slides very quickly. Basically, how do you form the, the, this precondition, precondition matrix? You could form in any way. The way, since we, we are motivated by sketching, we use sketching technique. One thing is use subsystem embedding, where you multiply the x and the y by some sketching matrix and use that to form mx, x, mxx, and myy. This is basically the same strategy that was used in the blended peak and in randomized least square solvers. Another idea is to just approximate the dominant subspace that appeared in a recent paper by, by uh, Gonen and co authors. Basically, you approximate the top uh, eigenvalues, uh, singular vectors, and you use that to form an approximation of the graph matrix, but you do, that works only for your regularization, and you need to compensate for the singular vectors that you, that you ignored. And that's only for lambda bigger than zero. So some preliminary experimental results. So we took the NIST uh, data set and we split it into halves, just took left part of the picture and right part of the picture and tried to find the correlation between them. And we are plotting the suboptimality in the objective, the true canonical correlation, and our approximate in the relative error. And we use warm salt for subspace embedding. And we use Riemannian CG. So, so in the x-axis is the iteration, and in the y-axis there is it's the suboptimality. This is, this is with the su dominant subspace precondition. This is, this is with the subspace embedding precondition. Different colors correspond to different choices of the of the preconditioner, the bigger the number is, the better the, the preconditioner is in approximating the true gram matrices. So generally, you'll do less iteration as the preconditioner is better. Also, the, once you, you have a very good preconditioner, the differences are pretty small. And you do see the exponential convergence. This is in, an, in a log scale. How do you uh, approximate the top k single vectors there for the dominant subspace? So, because, so you can do power iteration, but because you don't need, need a small number, then subspace it's... Subspace iteration? Yeah, right? subspace iteration. Yeah, you do subspace iteration, and since you, you only... You don't iteration count. No, I'm not doing, I'm not doing that, but because it's, you only need a few, it's very fast. If the gap is large. Yeah, if the gap is large. That's true. So the subspace embedding is, in a sense, more robust, but actually this also works pretty well. It's pretty fast, at least for this data set. Just as a baseline, if you're going to use identity preconditioners, no preconditioner, you're going to do 205 iterations. So you considerably save a lot of iterations here. And if you're going to use the exact inverses, what's basically the default, the best case, you're going to do 47 iterations. So by using approximation, you hardly pay anything. So you might be surprised why here we are even doing even less iterations than the exact inverses. And the answer is that because we form the preconditioner, we can do a warm start. We already have a good approximation of the canonical vectors that comes from the earlier results and so on. Sketches of CCA, so you start in a good place. So I'll just, okay, I have a slide, but I'll finish with this slide. Uh, we can also do second order methods. You can, we calculated the Riemannian ACN. That's become, if the Riemannian gradient is, is a bit crazy formula, that becomes a completely crazy formula. But you can compute it, and it's still efficient to compute it. And then you can use the Riemannian trust region method. That converges super fast. It's super, exponent, uh, super uh, linear convergence. But if every iteration actually solve linear equation using an iterative method, so the iterations are very close. So here we measure the x axis is product by x and y. And you see this nice convergence, and also as you have a better precondition, you generally do less iteration, less products with X and Y. That's your metric. This is this how many ND operations that you have. Um, I'll skip the parts about the theory and just conclude. Um, some, some concluding remarks is that random numerical linear algebra achieves high accuracy when used with precondition. And in some cases, you do want that. I'm not saying in all cases. I agree that in many scenarios for data science, you are happy with the cool approximation, but if you want high, high accuracy, you cannot do it with a sketch and solve approach. You need to use preconditioning. But high accuracy beyond regression required preconditioning method, and Riemannian optimization gives you a way to design those. And the way to introduce a preconditioner is by changing the metric. And we do it here for the quadratic equality constraints. But um, okay, we are still, this is still one point, but hope that it will soon be online.
I also have a quick question. And so after to, that, let's go to coffee break. I wanted to say your Riemannian approach, I think, <coughs> corresponds to no maximization of a matrix twice the size with zeros on the diagonal block and x transpose y on the off diagonal block. Um, you can think of it as a generalized eigenvalue on that metric, but, uh, and then you can... Just from a theory point of view. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that equivalence is known. Yeah, that equivalence is known, but then yeah. you, can, you can go that route or the other route, but it's the same. Yeah, you can do that too. All right, and let's thank Haim again. He's around at the coffee shop.